Okay, uh, we're gonna do we're gonna do a gedanken. A, a, a gedanken. i some of you I've told I've used that word before a gedanken. Mm -hmm. Phil, you know what a gedanken is? Yeah, a gedanken is a thought experiment. We're gonna run through an experiment. Uh, just doing it in our minds, not actually doing it, but this is one that wouldn't be very difficult to do. In fact, you probably did something kind of like it in uh, seventh grade general science. We're just gonna, we're gonna, of course, be a lot more detailed with it and make more out of it than uh, that we need. So imagine we've got a, a very simple vessel fitted with a one of my my perfect pistons there, so nothing is going to leak out. Closed system. Closed system. And going to heat it through flame. Blue flame. Taylor, come come home there, sweetheart. Are you all right? <laughs> Cheaper, sure. Two or three planets away. Yeah. What's, what's the weather like there? Is it okay? It's cold. Cold. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna heat this, and what we have in here is simply water, just water, uh, nice pure Adirondack spring water, the very same stuff they use uh, at the local breweries. The finest. Simple as that. What we're going to do, uh, this is a, a very easy project for us to do. We're going to monitor two things. One is we'll monitor the volume. That's very easy to do because we just watch what the piston does. We'll know exactly what the volume Well, we'll monitor the specific volume. Remember what that is? What? So volume monitor. Yeah, the volume. So we, so we measure the mass and the volume of the water we start with. And uh, so after that, since the mass won't change, we just monitor the volume. We'll know what the specific volume is. And we'll also... It's so nervous that I don't have exactly the right colors. We'll also monitor the temperature. Very easy to do. We can... We can we could even get the, the chemistry dopes to help us with this. <laughs> and they could, yeah, 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 yeah. And we could run this. <laughs> uh, the, the, what's a little bit different, they might do it in an open container. We've got to do it in a closed container because we don't want the mass to change. Plus, I don't want anything else in the container. If it was open, there'd be air, and then stuff would happen. So, uh, so we're going to go with this for now. And we're going to monitor the specific volume there and the temperature there as we run this little experiment. Now, this piston is massless. So uh, since there's atmospheric outside, then we know that our system pressure, the pressure of the water, is also atmospheric. It's not such a large vessel that there's any increase in pressure with depth. It's, it's a pretty small thing. It just sits right there on the desk. And so uh, uh, as we heat it up, and you know it'll start to boil after a little bit, and that's what we're going to run through, what will happen to the pressure? What will happen to the pressure? Nothing. Nothing will happen to pressure. Remember, this piston can move however it wants, and the, 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 it's massless, and so the, the force on the piston will never change, because atmospheric pressure is never going to change. So the force on either side of the piston will be the same. The pressure inside the system must be the same at all times. So this will be a constant pressure process. also known as an isobaric process. Iso is a prefix we use to mean held the same. 
So this is an isobaric process, uh, baric just from the very same thing like barometer. Isobaric process. So we're going to do this. All right. We'll start uh, with with the uh, fluid pretty cold, you know, right out of the tap. And so we'll be pretty much way down here. And we'll start heating it up. As we do so, we've got cold water, maybe, uh, you know, right out of the tap, maybe uh, 45 degrees or something. So pretty cold. We got a long way to go before anything really is going to happen. But uh, the temperature will certainly rise. So it's going to do so much like this. There's a very slight increase in volume as the temperature starts to rise. You know that because uh, as you heat up water, you know, it starts to get convection currents in it. The cold water sinks, the warm water rises. It does that right on your, on your stove <coughs> as you're heating up water. Oh, well, for most of you guys, even that's a stretch of your cooking talents, isn't it? So, uh, if you were microwaving water and had your head in there, <laughs> you'd see the little currents. So, so the, the, the water's heating up, and it's expanding, but only expanding a little tiny bit. So we, we keep heating it up, we heat it up, we heat it up. Keeps expanding a little tiny bit. That's a pretty steep line there. Until we get to a point where finally some bubbles start to form. And if you've ever been able to really watch this, you'll see they tend to form at the bottom because uh, these bubbles form, they need, a, they need something to form on. They need what's called a nucleation site. Usually, that's just a little thing in the water, a little piece of impurity of something. A lot of times, it's, it's pits or scratches or microscopic imperfections in the surface. If you've ever uh, boiled water in the microwave, in a brand new glass and it's brought up, it's nice and hot and then you stick the spoon in and it flashes. Have you ever done that or heard of it being done? You can probably find a YouTube video on it. What happens there is glass has very few imperfections in it. So it gets real, real hot, goes beyond the boiling point, but because there are no imperfections for bubbles to start forming, it doesn't start to boil. It just goes beyond that temperature. And then when you stick the spoon in, there's plenty of imperfections there. Plus you splash in a little bit of air when you do that anyway. And the whole thing boils suddenly because it's well over the boiling temperature. And it, it, it can be quite dangerous. Uh, people have been hurt from taking uh, superheated water out of the microwave and then having it suddenly boil and splash over. For you, for you chemistry people, uh, when you're boiling water, what do you do? You, Use a boiling you chip. put in boiling chips. What you're doing is putting in surface imperfections where bubbles can form. That's, that's all you're doing with that. Uh, so bubbles will start to form, and at first, uh, well, they'll almost always form at the bottom, just because that's where the heat is. They'll They'll form at the bottom. They'll start to rise, but they're rising into cooler fluid, so they'll collapse, and no bubbles will actually live long enough to get to the top. But sooner or later, the whole temperature is warm enough, and we start getting some boiling, so a, a, a good amount of boiling. And as we do so, we start to accumulate at the top some vapor with liquid in bulk below it. And because vapor has a much, much greater specific volume, much lower density, now the piston starts to rise. And you probably did this kind of experiment, watched the temperature as you boiled. You may not have had a seal vessel, but you probably did the thing where you boil while monitoring the temperature. What happens to the temperature as we add more and more heat and it's starting to boil. The temperature now stays the same. That's how we have boiling point. Whether it's boiling a little bit or boiling a lot, we only have one boiling point. And so 
uh, especially since ours is closed and we're collecting this vapor, this piston is really starting to rise now because a lot of the liquid, which is very dense, is turning into vapor, which is very undense. So the piston's really starting to move now and the temperature's not changing at all. So we start to get that kind of trace here going. We start to go across flat where all of the energy we're putting in, and we're putting lots of energy in, all of the energy in is, is going into boiling. It's no longer going into temperature change. And uh, uh, this is a very distinct corner. And that's a point, uh, that's the last point where there's all liquid and no vapor. Because from then on, we start forming vapor from the liquid. So that, that fraction starts changing. So this is, this is our last point. In fact, we, what we call this is the point of saturated liquid. Meaning that liquid has all of the heat in it it can possibly hold. It's saturated with heat. Any more heat, and it starts to boil. So that point is called saturated liquid. And we let it keep going. We start putting in more heat. Oh no, no we don't let it keep going. Because what happens in the middle of our tests? Folks from, break. Union yeah, break. union mandated coffee break. So we got it, and we can't leave this running. So we turn it off and it goes right back down the very same line. Just like this morning. So if we were boiling low carbon steel in there, that's so. So the mandated mandated coffee break is over. Back to work. Come in, start it up again. It goes right back up the very same line. Uh, especially since we haven't lost any of our mass. Remember, this is a closed system. So we're pouring pour, pour more heat in. We're getting more and more boiling. There's more and more vapor collecting. So that piston's rising higher and higher and higher. And the liquid level is dropping lower and lower and lower. Because more and more of that liquid's being boiled off, turned into vapor. But we're not losing anything because of the closed system. So we're getting more and more and more vapor, less and less and less liquid, until finally we've burned off all of the liquid and we have only now water vapor in here. And the piston's way up there because we boiled off so much. Uh, all that liquid turned into big fat vapor and we now are at a point of total vapor in the system. No liquid. If we cool it down one little bit, we start to move back this way, condensation starts to happen, we start to get some liquid back. And it would be right back along that line if we turned off the system and, and uh, turned off the heat source. Uh, right here, that's called the saturated vapor point. That's the, the, the last point at which we had any liquid. Everything in there now is vapor, but we're right on the point of going back down to condensation. So that's called saturated vapor. But we leave the system there. So now we have vapor in here and we're still pouring heat into it. Now what happens? Temperature, goes up. temperature starts to go up because it can't go anywhere else but to temperature change now. All the heat we were putting in during here was going to phase change. Now it's all one phase and it's going, it's just, all it's doing is increasing the temperature just like when you heat up anything else. How about the volume? Yeah, it's increasing and certainly increasing more than this did. So the line is not quite as steep, but we still get a pretty nice corner right there. And tends to go something like that. It's got a little bit of a curve to it. 
and that is the temperature volume trace of a constant pressure process. And at any point along the place we turn off the system, we'll come right back down. Uh, one of the symbols we use, we'll put a P there and a circle. That means that's a line of constant pressure. as opposed to a man of constant sorrow. Who got that cultural reference? Alan, you did. Uh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you play banjo or something, don't you? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, okay. You know that? We need a band. We need to have a, a mech band. Who's in? Uh, Phil, what do you play? Anything. Maracas? Sure. Ooh, nice pair of maracas. Go play piano. What? Yeah, yeah. Trumpet, trumpet, right? Trumpet, 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 yeah. Blue, bluegrass trumpet. Uh huh. <laughs> We're not going there. All right. So uh, there's a an isobaric process, a pressure constant pressure process, all the way through there, and that happens to be at atmospheric pressure. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you said that it would go back down the same line. As yep. And then you know, so it follows that line in direction. Um, I remember, I remember something from physics or chemistry, sublimation, I think it's called, where it skips, it goes directly. Sublimation is directly from a solid, from solid to a to gas. gas. Okay. And that's, that's how people on Mount Everest can dry their socks out. <laughs> because they can hang out their frozen socks and it'll the ice in the socks will sublimate to vapor and the socks will dry without the liquid, without the ice actually melting and then evaporating. Is that because of the really low pressure? Plus, very, very dry. It just, it just uh, it, the, the water molecules just leave the ice and immediately go into the atmosphere. Okay, so we've got, and, and we've, we need to, this is, this is evaporation going this way, it's condensation coming this way, but it's exactly the same line. And these lines are very reproducible, so these corners are also very, very reproducible. All right, so one thing we're going to do, too, is we're going to, we need some measure, something, we need some idea of the system, where we are on that, on that line. Because it's not good enough for us to say, oh, we're just somewhere on that line. We need to know exactly where we are when we're talking about the state of our thermodynamic system. We need to know, are we here one day or are we over here one day? So we need some measure of distance along that line. So let's see, let's, let's draw a little picture of what the system might look like somewhere in there. Here's our, our little system, the pistons, the piston's a lot higher than where we started, but the liquid line, uh, you know, maybe is, is something like that. So that's liquid and that's vapor up there, maybe looking something like that. As we go along, further along this line, the piston rises and the liquid line drops because we're burning off more and more of the liquid. And that happens continuously all along there. So maybe over here, our system would look something like this. Piston a lot higher now because we have a lot more vapor. And it would be continuous along that line between those two corners, <coughs> the saturated liquid point and the saturated vapor point or coming back the other way. It doesn't matter. This is reproducible in either direction. So what we're going to do is take this idea here and we're going to define a measure called the quality. Not perhaps one of the best terms ever chosen, but uh, defined as the quality. Our symbol for it is an X, and uh, Ease recognizes this symbol, uh, and we're going to show how we need it uh, coming up here shortly. Quality is defined as, 
the mass of the vapor in the system, which is all of that stuff up there above. See, there's the water molecules themselves right there. You can see them. This is an electron microscope chalk. Uh, the mass of the vapor, however much there is in the system, divided by the total mass. Now, when I say the mass of the system, I don't mean the mass of the container and the piston and all that. This is just the, the fluid itself. So another way for us to write it is the mass of the gas. We don't tend to put a V there, we tend to put a G. Not real sure why, but it's the vapor, that's the water in its gaseous phase, divided by the mass of the fluid plus the mass of the gas. So we're going to use that symbolism quite often. That, that subscript G and F, we're going to need those. In fact, in fact, this point right here, that's the specific volume. We, we call that the specific volume of the saturated liquid state. And so that's got a little V sub F. And this has a V sub G. So for our purposes, give or take a little bit, that quality, well, what are the limits on quality? What are its values, its possible values? Zero to one, because either we have no vapor or it's all vapor. So quality here is zero, quality here is one. It's essentially the percentage of the system that's vapor. 100% vapor there, 0% vapor there. So sometimes quality is done in, a, in terms of percent as well. And basically, this is a, a measure of how far we are along this line. It's not evenly divided along there, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty darn close. And, and we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so our Gedanken's not over. Good, thank you very much. We have more work to do. So we let the system cool down. We go out for dinner, get some orange food. Just get some what? Orange food. Get some orange food. Where you been? Okay, so we're going to rerun the experiment. We're going to re... What, did that make you guys hungry? We're going to rerun the experiment, and we're going to put a little bit of uh, mass on the piston. What will that do? That increases the pressure of the system. That's all it does. So now we're going to rerun it at higher than atmospheric pressure. That actually, uh, for the very same volume, will actually heat the system up a little tiny bit, the, the active pressure, because now the molecules are, are kind of a little bit closer together, sort of, but, but it's a very, very tiny difference. So we'll start running the experiment now at a slightly higher pressure. And it turns out we go past the boiling temperature. Oh, by the way, for that pressure, this is known as the saturation temperature. And now we're doing it at higher pressure, and we go past the saturation temperature, so we know well, there's, there's no saturation temperature is pressure dependent, we now know. And so we go past it a little bit, and sooner or later we turn the corner again, because vapor is starting to form. We're starting to boil again. And 
the same thing happens that we had before. We have a new saturation pressure, uh, sorry, temperature at a new pressure. And we let it run for a little bit more and we find that finally sooner or later it turns the corner and then starts to go up like that too. And notice the corners for these higher pressures are back a little bit. But for that pressure, so let's just see, that could be P1. This will be P2 greater than P1, which is greater than the P atmosphere in the course. Uh, the, the saturation line is a little bit shorter than it was at the lower pressure. Uh, and we talked about this, this higher boiling temperature at higher pressures. We talked about that, I think, in the first week. And, and Fiona denied that it ever happened. That the, In Colorado, at lower pressure, the tea and coffee is much cooler because of the lower boiling point. Then I, Alan got all upset. Who's drinking boiling coffee? And then, as usual, <laughs> once Alan started to contribute, the discussion went to hell. <laughs> Speaking of going to hell, no. uh, so you're saying that the, once it's boiling at the higher pressure, it will also go to vapor faster? Well, the rate. What do you mean by same faster? Amount, same the, 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 it, it, it goes to all vapor, all vapor at a smaller volume. Not necessarily faster in time, not. You know, this is this is not a rate time rate of change, but it is going to all vapor. Remember, that's what this corner is, and it's doing so at a smaller that's volume because of the increased pressure. Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, so not only is there a saturation temperature for each pressure, there's a specific volume for the fluid and a specific volume for the gas. Remember, saturated liquid saturated vapor, those corners are also dependent upon the system pressure. And at any point again, if we turn it off, we come right back down that line. So we run it again, put a little more mass on there, run it again, and the same kind of thing happens. So there's P3. And this is the direction of increasing pressure across those lines. So that's another way we designate this kind of thing. We put an arrow across those lines saying that's the direction in which the pressure is increasing. And we do that again. We get a smaller flat spot and so on until finally we've got just the right amount of mass on there, and we run the system, and we get no flat plot spot. Any pressure below that, we had even the tiniest little flat spot. Now we have no flat spot. We have an inflection, but no flat spot. That's the last pressure from which we have a flat spot. That's known as the critical pressure. because uh, that marks the, the point where we no longer have this transition, uh, a marked transition from liquid to vapor. What happens there is it all goes from liquid to vapor like that. And it's, there's, there's videos of it. I'll try to find one. And you, you're, you're watching this little vessel with some liquid in there and the, the piston's going up and then there's no liquid. You don't see boiling. You just see the liquid. It's, it's, it's not like, it just kind of morphs. Inside. It's not flash, it's not violent in any way, it just, it's liquid and then it isn't. And after that, if we keep running it, we get uh, barely even really any inflections. 
And if we go back to Ace Hardware, go back to Earl, tell him we want not a massless piston, but a negative mass piston, because we need to do this below atmospheric pressure. So the only way we can do that is with a, ma a, a piston that has negative mass to it. Maybe it's, I don't know how he does it. Maybe he fills it with helium. Or maybe he attaches little hot air balloons to it, or something. But it, it weighs less than zero. So now the system is at less than atmospheric pressure. So we can go the other way and we get kind of the same general things happening. Again, the, the transition from liquid to vapor, or vice versa, depending which way we're going, gets longer, at least longer in terms of the graph, and goes across it. And so, now that we've run all of these experiments, and all of these points have something in common, remember what happens at these corners? If we're going that way, that's the last point where it's all liquid. If we're coming the other way, that's the last point where there's any vapor. That's the saturated liquid point. These are the saturated vapor points, and we can join all those together. And they're green. We can join all those together, and it's going to look something like... something like that give or take a little bit. It makes this rather distinct dome. In fact, we call it the dome. So just to clean it up a little bit, we've got TV, and now we've got this dome. Like that. Under the dome, which is a very important region, there's liquid and vapor in coexistence. The liquid is saturated liquid because any more heat will turn it into vapor. The vapor is saturated vapor because if we take out any more heat it will condense and the two are existing in, uh, in equilibrium at any one point as long as, we're, as long as we're stopped at any one point at steady state. Over here, in this region, it's all liquid. To the left of the dome is all liquid. We call this either subcooled liquid because we're at, at a particular pressure. We're at a lower temperature than saturation because we're falling off here. Or we can call that a compressed liquid because the, high, the pressure is higher than saturation at a particular temperature. Either one of those uh, phrases mean the same thing. There's a, not a lot going on there because those lines are very steep and very close together. So just not a whole lot going on there. We're not going to worry too much about that. And over here in this region, is all vapor. It's above the saturation temperature because if we stay at the same pressure we're climbing up to temperatures above what the saturation was for that pressure. So we call it, uh, this is called superheat or this is superheated vapor. And at the tippy top is the critical point. To the left of that, this line is the saturated liquid line. To the right of that is the saturated vapor line.
Now, remember um, about a week ago, I told you about the state postulate. One guy remembers? Huh? I remember it. What's the state postulate? Not the stake postulate. The state postulate. It's very important to us. We need two intensive, independent properties to fix the state point. By fixing the state point, I mean we can put a dot and say this dot represents our system. Everything we know about our system, right, that dot is right there. There's our system. The trouble is under the dome, temperature doesn't change and pressure doesn't change. They're not independent under the dome. So temperature and pressure are enough to fix the state outside of the dome. Because at any place I could pick one temperature and go over to one pressure and I can put a point there. Under the dome, you give me a temperature, I know what the pressure is under the dome, but I don't know where I am under the dome. I could be anywhere because the pressure and the temperature don't change under the dome. They're not independent. So under the dome, we need more than just temperature and pressure to fix the state point. Outside of the dome, dome those would be sufficient. Doesn't mean we have them both, but they would be sufficient to fix the state point. And the deal about fixing the state point is once we fix the state point, we know all the other properties. If I can fix the state point, I know the volume. If I can fix the state point, I know, well, there's a couple other properties we haven't used yet that are coming up. I'll introduce one of them in a, in a minute. Under the dome, temperature and quality would be sufficient because that would fix the point perfectly for us. Pressure and quality would be sufficient under the dome as the two intensive properties. Under the dome, temperature and volume would be sufficient. But under the dome, temperature and pressure are not sufficient. So, there's our Gedanken. You're welcome. Uh, we need to redo it where, where we change, uh, maybe we change temperature and pressure but keep the volume the same. We could do that. We could just lock the uh, lock the piston. Earl wouldn't mind. He gave me a locking mechanism that comes with it. It's a little key. So we could we could fix the volume and just do temperature and pressure, and we get a, a different graph, but the same general ideas would happen. We could we could let the volume vary, but uh, watch change the pressure while we keep the temperature constant. That would be very difficult to do. Much more difficult experiment than this first one was. But we could do it. If we did that, temperature, pressure, volume, we'd have a 3D surface rather than a 2D surface where I only have two of them graphed here. Well, I kind of have three. But if I did all three of them together uh, or independently or however you do it, you get a 3D surface, and you've all seen that 3D surface over in the physics lab. There it is. There's the, there's the pressure, temperature, volume graph for water. So for tests, you need each to have one of these so you can read the values right off of it. It's right there. No, the, the, the uh, temperature, volume, there's the first graph I drew, temperature, volume, and there's the dome I drew. You can see it right there. If I've done pressure and volume over again, I still get a dome that just kind of kind of lays a little bit flat. Beautiful, huh? See? Looks just like my dome there. Vapor, yeah, liquid, and then even what happens 
uh, when it solidifies, when it freezes. We're not going to do very much with that because ice itself is a tough fluid to use in a thermodynamic system. It doesn't flow very well. I remember when I was first working as an engineer for GE, I, we were running software to model safety systems for nuclear power plants and uh, I was running the pump, the cooling pump system and, and I got some pretty interesting results. I took them into my boss and he said, uh, does it bother you at all that the liquid you're pumping is frozen solid? And I said, no, no, I'm fine with that. <laughs> But you know the, the software did not have freezing in it as one of the thermodynamic properties, so it just let the temperature go down below below freezing. What it didn't care, stupid software. So be careful. Ease ease is better with that kind of stuff, but it can do the same type of thing. Now um, these you you can imagine with full three dimensional surfaces and lots of different pressures and temperatures and volumes we could run through that this makes a, a rather large uh, a rather large thing uh, system to know not system uh, uh, values to know and so that's what in the back of your book are all of those tables especially tables A4 through A14. That's all of the temperature, pressure, volume tables, plus a couple other properties are all in there. All of this information in the tables is also available in E's, coded in E's. So, what I've got for you are, are a couple of the tables printed out, just so we can start to look at them. All right, this is just a, a photocopy right out of the book. Oh, by the way, on uh, on Angel, I found. Uh, a full set of these tables if you'd like to print them out and have them available just so it's easier to do that than thumbing through the back of the book you can print them out if you want they're 90 pages long uh, I'll stick to the SI tables though so that cuts it in half because in the English version there's also the English tables which are the exact same tables just in uh, English units. The uh, SI International Book only has the SI tables. Um, Ease does either one, and I'll show you how to do these, these tables on Ease. But here's, here's the tables to start with. Now they come in several different flavors, and so I couldn't print them all out. We'll have to get to them. The two big ones, the two main ones we need, are the saturated water temperature table, saturated water pressure table. These tables are all of the information for water under the dome, which is the saturated region. Outside of the dome, we're not at saturated state, and these tables don't apply, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. But these are the main ones we need, saturated water, temperature and pressure. These are exactly the same tables, it's just the temperature table is indexed on nice values of temperature and that's the temperature of these lines going under the dome. The saturation temperature at those lines and this is the pressure that goes with them. So you know at 45 degrees centigrade that will have a flat line at a pressure of what a 9.9.6 uh, kilopascals. The fact that these are one for one under the dome emphasizes that they're not independent under the dome, so they're not sufficient to fix the state point. 
If I know 1, I just know I'm under the dome, but I don't know where I am under the dome. These two things are not independent. They're one for one here. What I've got in the next column are those corners, the value for the corners, VF and VG. And always watch the units, but for 45 degrees centigrade, I know the saturation pressure, and I also know the specific volume of the liquid phase, and I know the specific volume of the vapor phase. And of course, the vapor is much, much bigger. Look how many times bigger the vapor is than the liquid in any one of these. Huge. So, um, if we need to know where we are under the dome, if we know the temperature, and we know something about, say, how much mass of gas there is, how much mass of vapor, we can figure out the quality, then we know where we are under the dome, and we can use that to figure out the percentage uh, of uh, vapor under the dome. I'll talk about that more in a little bit uh, in a second as well. The fourth column here, remember what U stands for? Internal energy. So this is the internal energy of the saturated liquid phase. So if you're right here on the corner, that's the specific, specific internal energy of your system right on the corner. As you go across the corner, you can see that the energy increases. Let's just pick that 45 again. We go from fairly low energy in the liquid phase up to fairly high energy in the vapor phase. So these again are the two corners. That's what the UF and the UG means. Notice there's a third column between them, UFG. All that is, and they don't do it for the volume, but they do it for the, uh, the internal energy. All that symbolism is, UFG is simply the difference between those two. It's UG minus UF. So VFG, which doesn't happen to be on the table, they just didn't bother tabulating it, partly because, well mostly because this is so tiny, it really doesn't make any difference. This doesn't even really figure into it. VFG is actually that distance at any particular temperature and pressure across the flat place under the dome. Yep. Uh, saturation pressure on this particular graph uh, or table. Uh -huh. that, I'm trying to see if I got this right. That's it right there. That's the pressure that you would need to put the system at for it to boil at that temperature. Right? At 45 degrees, yes. Yeah. Okay. If we're at some other pressure, there's some other boiling point. And the other table, the, the saturated pressure table, is exactly the same pressure just calculated on nice fat values of pressure. And when you pick up a particular pressure, right there is atmospheric. There's atmospheric pressure. And the boiling point is essentially 100 degrees, as you knew. These are exactly the same tables. You use the pressure one if you have the pressure value. You use the temperature one if you have the temperature value. Um, there's a couple other values on there. One is enthalpy, one is entropy. I won't talk about entropy yet. Um, however, if you need to for one of the exercises, look it up. There it is. Just look it up. Enthalpy, though, is a real big one for us. Enthalpy is a real important property for us. 
it's actually just a matter of convenience. If you remember, a couple days ago, we talked, of, well, we talked about internal energy anyway, but a couple days ago, I talked about the work of making a fluid flow, called it the flow work, and that led to a value of PV in our energy equation. We had U plus PV plus KE plus PE. KE and PE depend upon the problem. That's nothing we could tabulate. But U and PV we can tabulate. This pairing occurs so much, we decide to call it something else, so we define the enthalpy. N has exactly the same units as U does, which it must because they're equal. Well, they're equal plus them. And all three of these must have the same units. Kilojoules per kilogram in the SI system or BTUs per pound mass in the English system. Is that an intensive quality or an extensive qual uh, property? Paul says intensive. I think Taylor did too. How do you know? Well, it's per mass. It's also, remember, lower case. It's also equal to another intensive property, so it better be an intensive property itself. Pressure is not intensive, but specific volume is. So this this is this is enthalpy. Uh, there it is in the fourth uh, section. And again, the difference between the two is in the middle column. That's just Hg minus Hf. Huh? Oh, that's the that's the enthalpy of evaporation. To go from liquid to vapor, we need to change the enthalpy by that much. So that's the enthalpy of evaporation. If we were going the other way, it would be the enthalpy of condensation. But no sense calling it two things. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's practice using the tables a little bit. Uh, I believe I assigned problem 23. So if you have your book, there's problem 23. Uh, if, well, if you have your book, get it out anyway so you can do the tables. What? I walked in there and said so, didn't I? That's what I said. Do you realize what would happen if she lied to you? What would happen if she lied to you? The sun would come up. The birds would fly. It's just another normal day in paradise. All right. So uh, you don't need to see this problem, but you do need to see the tables so that we can do these together. All you're supposed to do for this problem is fill out the table for the uh, using the tables in the back of the book. And notice... Uh, each one of these is a particular state point. Notice for any one of the state points, you're always given two things. You have to be given two things to fix the state. That's the state postulate. Two things there, two there, two there, two there, two there. Once you have two intensive properties, independent properties, you can get all of the other things you need, and that's what the tables in the back of the book are for. So we'll do the first one. And I'll step you through. Oh, by the way, also on Angel, I have step-by-step -step instructions on how to go through the tables. There's a lot of tables, because there aren't just tables for under the dome. That's what the saturation tables are. But there's subcooled tables and there's superheat tables. So these are just the saturation tables that we'll we'll look at for these ones. And there's step-by-step -step instructions on Angel on how to how to do this. Print that out. It's two pages. Keep it with you. 
and you'll get better and better at this as time goes by. So, to fix the first state point, we're given the pressure. So we go to the pressure table. 400 kilopascals. So hopefully, I, there it is. 400 kilopascals. And the first thing you were asked to find in the table is the temperature. Maybe I'll write that up. Uh, temperature, pressure, enthalpy, quality. State one. 200 kilopascals. Now, we don't know specifically if we're under the dome, except for the fact the quality is between 0 and 1. If the quality is between 0 and 1, you're always under the dome. Because that means there's liquid and vapor together. So we're at 70% quality, so we know we're under the dome. So the temperature is 143.6, right there. Saturation, well, since we're under the dome, we know we're at saturation, temperature, and pressure. Where is that pressure? Pressure is given. Uh, no, no, sorry, I'm sorry, it wasn't 400, it was 200. I read it wrong. Right? 200 was that number? Yeah, sorry about that. Not uh, So we're at 120.21, sorry. 120.21. All right, but this is enough to fix the point. We know we're under the dome, but we don't know where under the dome we are. There's our dome. We know we're at 120 PSI, or sorry, 200 PSI. So maybe that line looks like that. We know now that the temperature, we know we're under the dome because the quality is between 0 and 1. So we know the temperature here is that 120.21. This again, temperature and volume. We know we're at a quality of 70%, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're perfectly 70% along there. But that's going to be good enough. What we're going to do is to fix this, the enthalpy of point 0.1, and this is the kind of symbolism we'll use, the enthalpy at state point 0.1 is defined as H, F, which is just right off the table. That's the enthalpy at the corner right there. Plus whatever the quality is, in this case it's 70%, 70% of the way along the enthalpy line. And that number is also right there in the table. That'll give us the enthalpy for the state point one. Read those right off the table. What's HF? Everybody see it? 504.71. If you can look at your own table in your own book, you'll see this perfectly. This is not your table. This is my table. Where's your table, young lady? Okay. Anyway, get the idea. So, 504.71 plus 0 0.7 times HFG, which very conveniently is right there on the table. Uh, HFG 22016. And the units uh, shown off the top kilojoules per kilogram.
So what's that come out to be? 2045, we'll just call it 0.8. We don't need a lot of detail in this. And there's the enthalpy of that state point, and we're, we're may, maybe somewhere along there. The, the lines of constant quality tend to go something like that. And there, that's how we fix, uh oh, there's the enthalpy, 2045.8, and the quality was given 0.7. And that's how we do that table. That's how we do that homework problem. Uh, problem, I think it was 23 in the book. And the phase. Saturated liquid and vapor coexisting, uh, boiling, multi-phase, whatever you want to say for it. Say dome, right? You can say under the dome, I guess. That's not really a phase, but it does locate it. So that, that's what it's asking there. Do you understand uh, where we are and what table we're in? Okay. Uh, you do uh, point three, state point three. We do the other ones, but offhand, uh, I'm not positive where they are. We'll like to check. I have experience. But you do state point three while I'm looking at what the deal is with state point two. Let's see if we want to do it. Yeah, we can do it. I'll show you in a second what I was looking at to tell. Okay, so state point three, pressure is 950. The reason I was looking is I want to make sure we're under the dome just because that's the table I happen to have printed out here that we can use. So fix the other two uh, values on that table, the temperature and the enthalpy. We have the pressure, so we want to go to the pressure table. Pressure is given as 950. Uh, I didn't print out enough. I needed to print the other page. There, Paul, open up your binder and donate it to us. No, nothing. It'll fall off. <laughs> okay, there we go. 950 is the given pressure. There's your temperature. Uh, we know we're under the dome. Actually, where are we? We're right at the edge of the dome. The left edge or the right edge? The right edge. Saturated liquid. Quality of zero. I means 0% zero vapor. We're all the way to the left of the dome. Uh, 177.66 and the enthalpy it's right off the table since we're right at saturated vape, uh, liquid we just do the saturated liquid enthalpy and it's 75 752.74 oops sorry that's point moved it up accidentally. Okay, um, point two is under the dome. Here's how I was able to tell by just glancing. Uh, temperature is 140, so I go to the temperature table. I go to the temperature table at 140 And that's right here. The enthalpy is given as 1800. 
So I looked at the saturated vapor and saturated liquid enthalpy, saturated vapor enthalpy, and the 1800s is between those two, so I knew we were in the zone. And so now you can do this problem uh, with the same tables I have up here, 140. There we go, there's all the columns and rows we need. So for state point two, which is 140 degrees, what's the pressure? It's 361.53. Enthalpy is given, 1800. The quality you find because you're given the quality of the state point and the other, or sorry, the enthalpy, given the enthalpy of the state point, the other two enthalpies are in the table you solve for quality. So quality is uh, H1 minus HF over HFG, which itself is HG minus HF. So it really is a percentage along the enthalpy line with that quality. And you've got all those numbers. Uh, 1800. What's HF? 589.16. And HFG, right out of the table, 2144.3. Worst thing you can do is just simply slip a row and, and not catch that you did it, so be careful. 21443. And this is the quality. If this does not come out to be between 0 and 1, you got something wrong. And so the quality comes out to be. They got it? 5, 6. 56% uh, quality. Either 0.56 or 56%. We use either one as, a, as, a, as our reference. There's lots to do with the tables. We're going to spend all day Friday just working through the tables, getting used to it, because there's a lot more stuff we need to to figure out. We need to figure it because there's there's several other tables we haven't even gotten to yet. We have superheat tables. We have compressed liquid tables. Um, there's different fluids. Uh, one of the very common thermodynamic fluids is a refrigerant known as 134A. So these are the water tables. We have tables for 134A. Uh, I can't remember offhand if we have ammonia tables. All kinds of things are available. So we're going we're gonna to spend some time working with those. If you'd like to stay, I'll now show you how to do these properties on ease. Which all you're getting ease to do is to look up the tables for you. It'll do all the inter, inter, interpolating calculations that you need to do with everything.